Casinos, the glitz, the glamour, neon lights and chinking crystal. This was once the scene everybody worth their salt wanted to be seen in and Las Vegas was king. But what's it like now? In the technology era, does the house ever lose? Do card counters still exist? And is there a formula for winning on roulette? I'm JJ Woods and this is The Knowledge. JJ Woods is a casino gaming consultant who has worked in casinos for more than three decades. In fact, if you put arcades in a similar bracket, he's been in casinos his whole life. But what does a casino gaming consultant actually do? I would cover all areas with land-based gaming, the psychology of the gambler. I've given talks to problem gamblers as well because I I see it from every side. But I spent a a lifetime communicating face-to-face with gamblers. I've watched them gambling. I've opened casinos. I've designed them and I've managed them. His most recent opening was the sparkling Carlton Club in Dublin, Ireland, where Woods is based for the foreseeable future. It follows years of travelling to exotic locations, Russia, South Africa, North Africa, the Caribbean and, of course, Las Vegas. Vegas is, is still probably the only... It probably is that place and it has that definition of it's like being in another planet. It really, it still holds that for me because it is an extraordinary place when you go and when you leave. It takes, it takes you a few days to come down from Vegas to say, my God, that was, that was extraordinary. I love the history of Vegas, though. I love how it started and Bugsy Siegel and all of those stories, you know, they're wonderful stories. I mean, one of my best trips to Vegas was, I think, was 90... I think of the day. I, I think it was ninety five. But at the time I went, it couldn't have been any better for me because um, they were blow, blowing in. I think it's called implode imploding. They were imploding the Howard Hughes Stratosphere Tower. So that I watched that being exploded, which is an iconic property. Well, it was. It's not there now. Robert De Niro was there with Sharon Stone making Casino. O.J. Simpson's two lawyers were in the Salon Privé at the Hilton, which I was staying, and they were gambling at a high-stakes table because O.J. Simpson had just got off, and I'm sure they got paid. The other thing that happened there was, I think Kerry Packer gave one of his biggest tips to a waitress. All happened on my trip when I was there. And did you know at the time this was happening around you? Yeah, I was there. I mean, they, 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 well, I knew the, the manager at the time from the Hilton and he says, JJ, do you want to come with me? And Because they had a special place to watch the building being blown up. And the, another thing was, the guy that was with us, he, he says to me, uh, he says, this is going to be very special. He says, because we've put extra pyrotechnics inside the building. So he says, you're going to see an awful lot of fireworks. I said, but why is that just for the people? He says, no. He says, that's for, they're making a movie called Mars Attacks. And this is going to be a part of the movie. Yeah, I have good memories of Vegas. It's a good place. Must you go to Vegas? Well, yes, says Woods, but perhaps not often. Just tick the box and move on. Where the casino thrill seeker goes next, though, Woods is unsure. I'd, I'd love to give you an answer, Jessica, and say, oh, no, if, you, if you've done Vegas, you need to do this. But there's so many opportunities now. There's so many. It, it, I mean, even in Australia, for God's sake, they've got some fantastic, op- you know, casinos. The Crown, which was, um, they also invested into Macau. Um, you know, um, this, there is so many destinations. I mean, Cyprus has opened, as you know. They, the North and South have, have casinos now. Um, I, I just read recently that Myanmar has, they're now launching their new casino legislation. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to go to old Burma, but uh, that that's going to be another interesting one. And of course, the Caribbean is always going to be a, a draw, isn't it? Though he talks it up, Woods isn't actually much of a fan of Las Vegas or any American casinos. What makes a good casino for him is attention to the finer details. He wants the right people serving and dealing, the right ambiance, dramatic lighting, and an escape from reality. That's what first drew him in. I was always involved as a kid. 
Um, I, mean, I think my first summer job was working in a in, a, in an arcade, a, a slot machine arcade. And in those days, you walked around with keys around your neck to open, literally open the door of each machine. So you had a key for every machine. But the only thing you were doing that in those days was actually unjamming a coin. Because there was no electrics. The, the only electrics in those days was to light up the front. Everything else was mechanical. The one, I suppose, that changed me, I mean, I'd worked for the bank for nearly, nearly four or five, well, four and a half, four and a half years I'd worked for National Westminster Bank in London. I started off as a clerk, as a trainee clerk. I was 17. I think I was the youngest ever to work for the bank. Youngest person ever. And then when I left, I was a senior cashier, which so I looked after all the tills, that sort of stuff. But the interesting thing was I was, I was actually in a bar one night after work and I met this girl who I hadn't seen for some time. She originally trained me when I joined the bank. She was like your, the person you, tr you, st you stay with for the first few weeks to learn about banking and, and stuff like that. And um, she, she says, I says to her, what, where are you now? What bank are you? What branch are you at? And she says to me, I left the bank. She says, I work for the casino. She gave me a number and I just phoned the number. And the interview was held in the Sportsman Casino in Tottenham Court Road. And the guy that interviewed me, at some point during the interview, he said to me, I'll show you around. And that, when I walked onto that casino floor at, I think it was five o'clock in the afternoon, to see people and the most beautiful girls in gowns and the beauty of the floor and the lighting. Um, it just, I couldn't believe that at this time of day, this, this type of facility was available. It, it was still quite secretive in those days. And that it, did it. Is it like an escape? Um, well, for me, it was an escape because I didn't like working days. So immediately in those days, uh, you did mostly night shifts because that's the busiest time. So I love the fact that you could work nights and because uh, I wasn't a day person. I was one of those people I felt I wasn't a day person. I just I came awake at night. So it suited me for, for that. But the rest of it was, I mean, there, there was a lot of etiquette about it. There was, you, you know, I mean, you had to, your nails were checked every night. Even the men's nails were checked. You have to, there was a little small board that you put your hands on before you went on the floor to make sure that your hands were your nails weren't bitten. There was a grooming procedure. There was a lot that I liked at the time about that. I liked the idea of that you had to kind of prepare yourself for work. You couldn't just roll out of bed and go to the casino. You had to be well groomed. There was a, there were there were specific rules about that for girls and boys. You know, the hair had to be swept back. Makeup had to be perfect on the girls. There was no beards, there was no moustaches. You weren't allowed it, anything like that. It was just, just the way they wanted it. You had to be very well presented. It's not like that today. I would have said it was like that throughout, right up to about mid, mid nineties. I don't think that's the case today. I think the standards have dropped a lot. So what's it like walking into a casino today? Let's assume it's a European, casino. I'm always careful not to use words that are um, industry words because I want people to understand exactly what I'm saying. But we are we actually call reception quarantine. It's probably not the right word. But reception is the first thing you're going to meet. And you're going to meet somebody very friendly, very nice. But they do want information. You know, that is what we, from the, de from the point you walk in, we're collecting information from you. Um, especially with the AML procedures now. We're going to stop JJ there because this is an interesting point. Okay, so AML procedures are anti-money laundering measures. In a place like a casino where so much money is changing hands so rapidly on a daily basis, it's really important to know where the money is coming from and where it's going. However, not everything a casino tells you is for AML is actually for AML. It's important to be aware of that. Woods can explain. The AML would have you believe that the procedures that are in place today in casinos are actually part of this compliance. They're actually not. Um, what we do today, we were doing 40 years ago. 
were actually doing exactly the same. We wanted a photograph of the person. We wanted details of who they were, of their address, where they lived, because that information was all good for us. The procedures that are there today, okay, they are part of the AML, but to suggest they were brought in because of AML, I think you'll probably find this one question on an application form uh, in a European casino that says, are you a PEP, which is politically exposed person, PEP. Basically, are you connected to an embassy? Are you a diplomat? Are you working in government? And that question's only been out for a few years. So yes, the information you give a casino when registering is important to help maintain anti-money laundering measures, but do be aware that it isn't the only reason they take your information. Right, so JJ was walking us through the casino and we've gotten to the reception, which inside is called quarantine. Why is that, JJ? But up to, up to this point, when you walk into the casino, we're collecting information. We want to know, we want to know about you, your passport, et cetera, et cetera. Um, from there on, I mean, you're going to go, usually, we normally hide the casino from you. So at reception, you don't really see a lot which is why we have this nickname of quarantine. We call it a quarantine, like you're held there. Because remember, if we don't want you to come in, it's very easy for us to ask you to leave in that, in that particular area. Imagine if you walk straight off the street and you're in the casino and there's a problem or we don't want you. You could upset the other people because they're all playing these games that, you know, they're concentrating and all of a sudden there could be a scene. So reception is normally closed away from, from the actual casino. The other reason for that as well, and certainly if I design a casino, I, want that as a, I do want that to be the wow factor. So when you leave the reception, whether you go up the stairs or you go down a corridor, there has to be a point where these doors open and then you go, I want you to go, wow, that's my job. Mm. Because when you look, you're going to just be surrounded by hopefully a beautiful room beautiful people that work there and you're going to get somebody that's going to come up and say to you immediately pretty quickly when you walk in they're going to say would you like a drink what can i do for you or you know so this you're very you're made to feel very welcome for when, when, when you arrive so what are the signatures of a, a jj woods casino it's a good question um usually lamps above the table i love the lamps just above the table. The lights have to be on dim, or I have to be able to at least control the lights. Because I always think it's old fashioned, but I still think the action is on the table. And I think the table should be just that bit brighter than the rest of the room. So the rest of the room is nice and it's lit. But a signature for me would be the lamp directly above the table. And the roulette two lamps, one for the wheel, one for the base. But on a blackjack, just one. And it's usually quite a beautiful one with tassels. Blackjack so happens to be Woods' game. He's been playing it for years and has a really useful tip coming up here. If you're just into quick thrills at the casino, he's also going to share his roulette strategy, stressing that you never really can employ a strategy on a casino game of chance. I guess one thing we ha- I haven't asked, which is kind of an obvious question, is do you, do you play casino games? Yeah, Blackjack is where you have... Uh... You see, all the games we play in the casino are games of chance, except blackjack. That's not a game of chance. It's uh, it's you've got an input. I suppose I've got to be careful because the gaming board says you can't interfere with the outcome of a game, but the the customer can interfere with the outcome of of a a game of blackjack because you have a choice. You you, you've you've got input. You can make decisions. Uh, Whereas roulette, the only decision you make is putting a bet on. You know. I've often played roulette for a bit of fun, but no, my, my game for, of choice would be blackjack. So explain for someone who doesn't know what blackjack is, what happens when you sit down at the table? Actually, at my age, I can probably give you away some secrets. Um, blackjack is, is very simple. The house edge for us is, I mean, you can talk about percentages and one thing or another, but if we just keep the percentages away and just talk about the, the raw game of blackjack, the house age really is, is kind of fear, but fear in a very small way, because remember, you're having fun as well. 
But the fear is basically um, you don't want to bust. That's the main thing. You don't want to go over 21. What people forget is that you don't have to get to 21. Like the job is just to beat the dealer. It's called blackjack and everybody's got the color card and the ace in their head and they think that's the best hand. It is. But the reality is people often think I have to get very close to 21. And sometimes you don't. The job is actually to beat the dealer. The reason the house has a good time with this game is because an average blackjack table has seven positions for the players. Now let's assume there's four people playing. That's four people who all have to make a decision before the dealer. Remember, the dealer makes no decision. So if you think about it, that if all make decisions, and some of them in, in those decisions could have gone bust. So the dealer's taking their money even before she draws her card. And then she draws her card. So it's a kind of a... The reason that casino wins is because you have to make a decision before the final card is drawn. Before you know what you're up against. Exactly. You know, because you're, you're anticipating. So, blackjack requires a bit of patience, a bit of restraint. Resist that urge to get to 21, says Woods. Just get yourself to a nice place, a solid place. Maybe a 4, 5 and an 8 for 17. Something like that could work. Because you just never know what the dealer will draw. Roulette is a different ball game altogether. But Woods has got an idea that can get you in the money. The roulette is fun because um, it's game of chance. So if we were to, if we're telling anybody, I usually say to them, if people ask, I always say treat it like a birthday cake and take a slice. And the slice is usually five numbers, you know, um, because the idea of the ball landing exactly in that one number that you've betted is going to be pretty hard. So what I say to them is you bet five numbers and keep the same five. Just keep betting the same five numbers with a small stake. Not, not a, you know, you can do it for, I don't know, $5 a spin or whatever. So five numbers, a dollar in each number. The idea is that the ball will, could land in that section of the wheel and one of your five numbers as opposed to just betting one number. But there's lots of different, I mean, there's so many principles. Um, you know, there's the double up principle on black and red and... People try all these sorts of things on the games, but they, they don't work. <laughs> Throughout the casino are also hundreds of slot machines and, of course, the poker room. But poker isn't like any other casino game. And in fact, Woods explains poker players aren't casino people. They are poker players, full stop. In my opinion, OK, let's go back to the beginning of Texas Hold'em. Roughly 1999, 2000, it started to really gather speed. So 20 years ago. Um, and of course the internet then just pushed it, you know, to become the most, certainly the most popular game in the world. It didn't matter whether you were a plumber, solicitor, accountant, all of these people played this game. It was an extraordinary, it broke all the boundaries. You know, it was a game that just everybody liked. You can't say that about blackjack and you certainly couldn't say it about roulette. So it was extraordinary. But the mistake the casinos made, if you go back to 2000, uh, and around about 2003, 2004, 2005, all over the world, the new architects, the new plans, the new casinos, these monster casinos that were being built, instead of the casino being the, the, the bigger floor space, all of a sudden you had poker rooms designed that were four times bigger three times bigger than the casino itself. I call it the trawler net system. And the idea is that the casino at that time believed if we can bring hundreds of people into the poker room, which is, you know, within the complex, um, and we can do this tournament. Of course, as the tournament works, it's perfect because it knocks people out. So the casino believed, oh, even if we get the small percentage of these people to come into the casino and play blackjack, play roulette, this is going to be very good for us. It just didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen, even though they kept trying and trying, um, they're different people. Whilst the roulette or blackjack enthusiast lives to gamble and take chances, the Texas Hold'em poker player is more secretive, more calculated, more reserved. 
from I'd made my mind up if I open any casino, they will not be in the same room. The poker will be in a separate room and it won't be big. It'll be a small room. It's not going to be such a big room because you just don't get the percentage. If you look worldwide, what happened, they, they made these rooms very big. Then they started putting the polka rooms in, in the same space, thinking, oh, if they're in the same room, they only have to go from here to here to get to the roulette. But what they did was they complicated the whole thing and they tried to mix a different person completely into, um, in, into the hard gaming and uh, it didn't work. So for that reason, as a consultant, I will always advise uh, the client to keep the two rooms separate. He makes the poker room more comfortable, quieter, with armchair seats all set up for the long haul. You don't generally have to spend too long in the other areas of the casino to get to it, and you don't have to on the way out either, but you still get the same level of customer service. Having worked in so many jurisdictions and been involved in such a vast array of casinos, the absolutely burning question now is what does JJ Woods think is the best casino in the world? A casino that really impresses me uh, is the Hippodrome in Leicester Square, um, which is run by Simon Thomas. That for me, that just does everything for me. That is the experience. You go there and my God, you know that you've been to a casino and you come out of there and it's like, it's like going to a blockbuster movie. You feel, you come out of there and think, I've had a fantastic time. The experience factor is alive and well. JJ makes an excellent point here. When you go to a shop and spend money, you leave with an item. There has been an exchange. When you go to a casino and spend money, you can either leave with more money or less, but there's no product. The best casinos in the world for Woods do give you a product though. They give you an experience, much like a fun fair ride would. You leave with a feeling, a memory. How do they do that? Most operators would tell you that what happens on the table is the most important because that's where the money's exchanged and that's where the gaming takes place. But my attitude has always been that it, it, what's, what's equally, if not more important, is what happens around the table. The action is not just on the table. There's lots of other factors to take into consideration. It's a bit like going to a fun fair. If you go to, um, if you go on one of these big dippers, you've paid to go on that and you've had this experience, but you've come off, you're laughing, you're thinking, wow, You've got a great memory of what happened. And I think this is what happens with operators sometimes. They forget that people, a majority of people, leave the casino. And if they haven't had the experience, like the Big Dipper, they leave with nothing. You see, I'm a stickler for um, just the way it's done in the UK. You know, um, there's, there is that McDonald's factor of... No disrespect, because we've learned an awful lot from America. But um, there is that kind of McDonald's um, customer service that you can experience in casinos in the States. And it just doesn't do it for me. There's something quite genuine about, um, more genuine, I think, than with European casinos. Maybe because they haven't been doing it that long. You know, maybe America's tired. I think they're more genuine, the European casinos, when it comes to the customer service. I think there's a genuine feeling there. Oh, somebody's trying to help me. They're going to fix my drink. They're trying to do the best. Or the dealer's hoping that I'll win with the next card. There's still that. Now, maybe I'm old-fashioned because I trained in the UK. But then I have worked in many other countries as well. You know, and I've done Vegas. I've been to Vegas. So I've seen the, the difference. So I have, a lot of, I have a lot of respect for it. But I'm, I'm basically... Um, I, I, I don't, I think that wheel them in and wheel them out is not for me. I, I, I still take a very personal uh, stance when I consult with, it, with a casino. I'd, I'd be very particular about how people are received and certainly how they're beckoned good night. I think it's so important if you want them to come back. Woods is also focused on creating a theme for a casino. It must be this different world inside and it must be different. If you call yourself the Palm Beach Casino, it must feel like Palm Beach inside. For all its faults, Las Vegas does remain the home of casino, the mecca, the behemoth of card playing and chip spending. And like it or not, it has had an effect on all other casino resorts that followed. 
I, I think we could never say that we haven't learned from it because it has, it's an, not just in gam gambling and the games and the options and the, but ju just marketing, they, they were right on top of their game. With, they invented junkets, which is something I was involved with. Um, and I think this country should be doing, but we're not doing it. We're the, we're the best country in the world to do junkets here because we've got the best horse tracks. We've got fantastic golf courses. And junkets are all about um, bringing people into, a, into a, a country, keeping them busy in the daytime, bring them to uh, golf, race meetings, festivals, and then at night time they go to the casino. That is the epitome of a junket. But we learned this from America. Like junkets started in America way back, you know, in the 50s. And, um, you know, they were buses. There was just these buses that would come along and collect all these people and bring them to, to the casino for the day. So th there's a great history of marketing of how the business evolved in America. So yeah, I, I respect that, I, I really do. If Vegas is casino past, the Hippodrome is casino present, what then is casino future? Land-based casinos face pressures from online casinos and perhaps vice versa, with technology in physical casinos advancing at a similar rate. One of your uh, big focuses on when you're setting up new casinos is to restore the casino experience to its past glories. But what is in the future of casinos? What will casinos look like in five or ten years' time? It's a very good question. Well, they used to say, I mean, even going back 10, 15 years ago, people used to say people are eventually going to get fed up with online and they'll go back. Best example I can give you is if you go back some 10, 15 years ago, even longer, um, some of the biggest hotels in the world, resort companies, um, came to us and they would beg us. I mean, that's how I worked in those countries, in Russia, in South America, in Caribbean and North Africa. I went there because these big companies says, you know, will you please, I mean, please put a casino in the hotel. Will you please put a casino in the resort? People wanted to attach themselves to us because uh, we, we were a winning show. The way it's changed today is we're going to the hotels and we're going to the resort companies. We're going to these holiday resorts. We're saying, can we please be part of your show? The dynamic has completely changed. So the business is, is dramatically changed. It's not the popular, uh, the land base is not what it used to be. I think the only thing that will keep it alive, and the only way it will survive is if we attach ourselves to other experiences. I think we have to follow the American route. Um, we do need to do the show and to get to the show, you have to walk through the casino, but it's a fantastic show. It's a big act. It's a successful act. It's a rock band. It's, it's something very special. You go there and then you can have a fantastic night in the casino. We need to get involved with other experiences. I think we have to say, we will give you the experience. I don't think land-based just on its own playing nice music at night. I think those days are, are fast. There's probably a handful of countries they would probably survive in, but for the big business, I think we need to attach ourselves to other, other attractions. What about, um, what about technology? Will we ever have something crazy like robot dealers or cards that deal themselves or something? We have virtual dealers already. You can see those if you go to the show, um, the ice show in London. Um, well, they started off as TV, like as a screen. So there was a massive TV screen at the back of the blackjack. And when you sat down, the girl says, good evening, how are you? So it kind of works like online, you know. So that's been there. But now there is a virtual, you know, like a virtual dealer. So it's it's there, whether it'll... I don't I don't think it's... it's I still don't think it would have any place because I think people would just revert to online. Is it like a hologram? Yeah. Do you get a physical card? You don't get a card. It's a great thing to watch, and I did see it, but having said that, I, I still go back, but again, I might be, as you said earlier, there is this old-fashioned thing about casinos, and there always will be. I still think the engagement is very important. With a robot or virtual dealer, the player is essentially alone. 
in the best casinos, dealers are incredibly highly trained in player psychology. They know when a player is going to fold or when they have placed their last bet. They know how to treat a player on a winning streak or a losing one. For many reasons beyond a player's enjoyment, that is really valuable to the player as well as the casino seeking to get the player to return. And it just cannot be done by computers, as cool as a hologram dealer might be. They also probably couldn't spot cheating. The days of top hatting, um, I think, are pretty much gone. What is top hatting? Top hatting is is taking is putting a increasing your stake when the dealer's not watching. So they they actually put a chip on on the chip. I don't know if you remember Tiddlywinks. If you ever heard of that game where you flick a, a, a circular, a coloured um, like a counter used to flick it called tiddlywinks it's an old game but these guys were brilliant i mean they could actually flick a chip during the wheel spin of a roulette and they can land it directly on top I and mean, it had to be directly if you watch any casino in the world just before the dealer spins the wheel she uses this finger here and she can go like that over a few of the bets and the reason she's doing it that is we call it a dirty stack if, if one of the chips is not perfectly if the, the, it has to be a perfect cylinder we don't like chips sticking in or in and out so she'll go like that and she'll straighten them so if this guy's chip that he flicks doesn't land directly on top perfectly they'll know something happened and they'll ask for a camera rewind and that's in the point where the wheel the ball has landed She's locked over to see the ball, and in that time, he's put the chip on top of the winning number. There's a few. I don't think those guys are around anymore, but they were. They were called top hatters. Whilst top hatters are a thing of the past, card counting still exists. Card counters, generally people naturally gifted with photographic memories, play blackjack. During the games, they decrease the house advantage by keeping a running tally of high and low cards in their heads. It allows them to bet more with less risk. And casinos are clearly not fans. But does Woods himself see it as cheating, or is it just a natural advantage? It's a difficult one. Um, I've taken them on. We have a thing called the... It's not called the Griffin Book. It used to be called the Griffin Book. It's now called um, Central Credit Nevada. But it's the book of cheats. And it's kept in... in um, in their offices over it's a big company now the, the um, central credit and they keep a book of all the disguises these people use because they use moustaches they use all sorts of different things to get into the casinos because a lot of them would be barred in the past we've seen them in the book they are these are definitely card counters but we've taken them on because they don't always win they don't always beat us and um, the formula has to work everything has to be perfect but generally speaking, if you certainly don't monitor them and they just allow them to come in like, without taking any real precautions, yeah, they can beat you. They, ha they do have an unfair advantage. It's an unfair advantage just because they are better at maths? Because they're born with photographic memory, I suppose, is good. It, that's, that's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit special. It's such a hard question to answer because there's, there's a part of me that admires them because they have this special talent. But like they are executing a talent that makes the game more in their favor. But I don't think I'd be, I don't think I'd be terribly angry with 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 a card counter. I, I, I don't think they're they're not the they're not really the type of cheat or a top hatter or somebody that's genuinely trying to steal money from the casino. I, I don't see them in that light. They're gentlemen in some ways, but they're not the real cheats, I don't think so. And I don't think they're real thieves either. I think they're just... Uh, but unfortunately, I, 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 I can't change all the operators' opinion. And most operators wouldn't like to have them in the casino. Online casino does have more users than its land-based father. But what Woods has been trying to tell us all along is that the two are not the same and they do exist together. He does think that poker particularly will survive in the future online, where it has grown astronomically, but also that if the casino operators just focus more on the show, the gaming will take care of itself and the glitz and the glamour of the old school casino will return. The keys to the future, he says, are right there in the past. 
You've been listening to The Knowledge Podcast, brought to you by gambling.com. To hear new episodes as soon as they're released, make sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Simply search for The Knowledge on your preferred platform. Visit gambling.com forward slash podcast for full access to our extensive podcast library. To keep up to date with all things gambling, make sure to follow gambling.com on Twitter at gambling underscore com. Thank you.